cave dwellers hunted the horse for food. But as humankind evolved, so did its relationship with the horse. Humans began to see the horse as a noble creature, a loyal servant, and a true companion. And so it has been. For 5,000 years, the horse running with us through different lands and civilizations, through time and experience. Today, the services of the horse have been greatly diminished, but the bond between horse and human has never been stronger. Join us as we examine this fascinating relationship in a six-part series, The Horse. I've been over there fighting the jump right there, so you classically Some historians believe that our decision to domesticate the once wild horse was one of the most important developments in human history. Right up there with the invention of the wheel. Whether we agree or not, one thing is certain. Without the horse, civilization would have taken an entirely different course. It all began with our decision to stop hunting horses for food. We somehow came to the rightful conclusion that they served a much more important purpose alive than in our bellies. And the natural wild attributes of the horse, speed, strength, and an ability to adapt to its environment, were the exact attributes that we needed in the horse to enable it to work for us. And work it did. From the outset of our new relationship with the horse, we put it to work. Its job was to carry and pull. Plows, products, guns, and people. And that was their calling for centuries. Their claim to fame and fortune, and sometimes misfortune. And of course, it wasn't long before we learned which kinds of horses excelled at what jobs, the right size, a good shape, the perfect disposition. Horse owners brought mares and stallions of diverse types together to breed the kind of horse they wanted. A large, powerful horse to take down trees and pull heavy plows through the unforgiving ground. A swift, sure-footed horse to help hunt other animals or to carry soldiers into battle. A small, tough-coated horse to labour in the cold and wet of rugged coastal terrains. And even a horse almost small enough to be a household pet. Join us as we meet some of the present-day descendants of these breeds and crossbreeds shaped by horse owners over thousands of years. Horses, big, small, and in between. The biggest of horses are the draft breeds. Named from an Old English word dray, meaning to pull, this class of horse is probably best represented by the Clydesdale. Originally from the Clydesdale region of Scotland, they go back to the 17th century 
being a mix of Scottish, English and Flemish farm horses. By the 19th century, Clydesdales were being shipped all over the world from Australia to Russia to work on farms, in timber forests and in coal mines. But by 1945, Clydesdales were largely replaced. The tractor had taken over. And by 1950, the Clydesdale was in danger of disappearing as a breed. But Clydesdale lovers in Scotland, Australia and elsewhere were not about to let this faithful workhorse disappear. The Clydesdale Horse Society and other equine-centred organisations undertook a vigorous campaign to revive the breed and restore its status as one of the most admired and sought-after animals among horse lovers. Although their traditional usefulness didn't return, the popularity of Clydesdales as show horses did. Today, the impressive size, versatility, grace and handsome looks of these tireless and faithful labourers attracts crowds around the world, including Canada. Everybody has their own priorities when they're judging animals or buying them or selling them. It's the same thing. Some people have priorities on movement or basic conformation or some people like a really high-headed horse. My things are, I like really correct movement and I like really good bottoms on a horse. But you know within your own mind what an animal is supposed to look like. So you're comparing each animal that you look at with this picture in your mind of what the perfect animal would look like. And the one that's closest to that is the one that gets to be champion. First place goes to Sarah Hayes from Price. Mostly they're a show animal and a pet and something people use for pleasure. Might be parades or sleigh rides at home, weddings, carriages, more that type of thing. In Ontario, there's quite a few Amish and Mennonite settlements, but they use predominantly Belgians and Portrons. There's not very many Clydesdales used for work animals. I always tease and joke that Clydesdales are way too smart to want to work, <laughs> that it's much better suited to the Belgians and Bertrands. Their popularity just keeps growing. Thrusting the Clydesdale into new roles this noble old farm animal would never have dreamed of. They're nicknamed the friendly giant. Their size intimidates you, so that's why they don't need to be nasty. Not much frightens her. As they say, she's bam proof. <laughs> when you're in town, I mean, there's buses and there's fire trucks and there's motorcycles and there's cement trucks and dozers and backhoes and all kinds of noises that could spook a horse. But Jenny doesn't seem to mind any of that. A lot of them want the slow pace and the elegance and the Cinderella scenario of the horse and carriage for their weddings. It's a funny thing about that, isn't it? Years ago, everybody was going around getting a ride in a car. Now everybody wants to ride in a horse and carriage. <laughs> How times change. <laughs> Off of George Street. The Percheron, descended from the horses that medieval French knights rode into battle, its size and agility are perfect for police work. With their sturdy feet and strong leg bones, they can easily navigate a few brick stairs in a narrow alley. Well, all types of horses are used for police work. They can be a corridor horse or a draft horse like this. We went with uh, Percherons, which is a heavy draft horse. They have a great demeanor. They're gentle giants, but yet they're very agile on their feet. They can move side to side and jump over things. Plus their size is a, a good factor. You can see a lot higher and it's good for intimidation if need be. 
Undaunted by the turmoil and destruction of medieval battles, the Percheron's ancestors passed on a resilience and mild temperament that makes work in the city a breeze. Well, when you're on top of the horse, the horse feels everything on his back. He can sense the fact that if we're nervous or not, and that helps a lot of horses make sure that as a rider, you're not nervous, which will make the horse not nervous. You never get off your horse. You'll hold the uh, suspect uh, until a patrol car or a member comes who's on the ground to arrest the person. Stand. 376, three unit here on George in uh, Williams Lane. We have two in custody today. Vince weighs in at 1,900 pounds currently, and he's 17.2 hands tall, measured right here to the withers, hands. Uh, we feed Timothy alfalfa hay cubes, uh, approximately nine pounds in the morning, nine pounds in the evening, and that's it. And what you see is what you get, a perfect conformation, really well muscular built horse, very athletic. And wow, good boy. Very, very strong horse. Very, Vince is 11 years old now. He's in the prime of his life. Hope to get a lot more years out of him. We probably won't consider retiring Vince until he's about maybe 20 years old. Rushing into a crowd obviously would, would not be the thing to do. So we advise people, you know, if you don't listen to what we're asking, then we'll, we'll have to deploy horses. And in fact, these guys will move people. So if I'm asking him to go into that crowd and asking him to move sideways, he's going to obey me and listen to what I say. So if I were in the crowd, I would just collect up my rein just to get his attention. I would apply the right inside of my calf, a little, a little touch of his head, and we should go sideways. He may be picking up his feet and doing all this sort of thing because he may not want to be there. But it's very intimidating to see a 1,900 pound horse with me up on top there that my eye level is about 10 feet in the air and this guy's bang, bang, bang on the pavement or concrete with steel shoes. It's a very intimidating thing to see that and very effective. Right up. Come on. Keep up. Every day with Vince has been a pleasure, but it's a learning experience. And every day he will show you something new. When you can work with something uh, as calm and gentle as uh, an animal like Vince, it's very, very rewarding. It's fantastic. With the long-standing and widespread admiration for the big draft horses, it's no surprise that they show up everywhere mixed with other breeds. Another of the draft horses, the Belgian, frequently shows up in the same riding circle as the quarter horse and the standard bred. This time, Jim is talking about the horse known as the Canadian. And this brings us to the mid-sized horse breeds. Well, these are my prize Canadians. These horses are an all-around horse. In the horse world, these horses are known as the little iron horse. They can pull with the Pertron, they can pull with the Belgium, and you can ride them, they can jump, they're in their size, they're an all-around animal. The Canadian can be traced back to horses sent to the New World in the 1600s when the King of France was trying to establish a French colony in Lower Canada. Historians tell us the king started by shipping 400 men, 50 women, some cattle, pigs, chickens, 12 mares, and two stallions. When Louis XIV, the reigning king of France, sent animals from the north of Spain to the settlers and the pioneers that were on the St. Lawrence River. This is where it all began for the Canadian a hard-working and sure-footed animal that worked the farms and forests of eastern Canada and also became popular as a carriage and cavalry horse. In the 1800s, its reputation as a soldier's horse spread south to the American states. The horses flourished. In 1860, the Northern Army came to Canada and they bought 20,000 of these horses and took them to the United States for the war effort in the Civil War. Against all odds, the Canadian has survived. 
They almost disappeared by being bred with all kinds of other horses. At the turn of the century in 1900, serious horse people in Quebec took a look around and said, well, our stock of purebred Canadians was in very, very poor condition. They started to really keep good records in breeding these horses. By the 1930s, the breed had been mixed with faster and lighter horses so often that the government had to declare the Canadian a closed breed, meaning owners had to stop exporting them to breed with other horses. By this time in the U.S., the famous Morgan horse and the standard bred had advanced as breeds by being bred frequently with the Canadian. In 2001, by an act of parliament in Ottawa, these horses were registered as the Canadians. And they are the only horse that is known to, uh, to the horse world that's native to our country. Okay, boys, okay. You've got your fill today. Another example of horse entertainment is the RCMP musical ride. Inspector Bruce Willems ensures that each horse receives the best of training and treatment throughout its career as a musical ride horse. The horses themselves are actually a Hanoverian American Thoroughbred cross. As you can see, they're black or very dark brown, all about the same size. Hanoverian are a very easily trained horse well suited to our program. They have a nice size of bone in their body and their legs. But as well, and very important to us, is the temperament of the horse. Obviously, these animals receive a lot of public attention from children, from everyone. And they must be a type of horse that is comfortable with that. And Commissioner Wood in 1940 decreed that the musical ride would use only black horses. I understand it was because it goes well with the Red Surge. Our biggest challenge now is to find black horses. Approximately 7% of the horse population in the world is actually black. With that regard, what we did was develop our own breeding program. I have two Hanoverian stallions and approximately 23 broodmares. There's several things we look for in, in our horses, and that is a confirmation or the shape of the horse. You know, make sure it's pleasing to the eye, and most people can look at a horse and say, that looks like a nice horse. Well, that's what we look for. It's a confirmation you're looking at. For this world-famous Canadian equestrian event, the middle-sized horse is the horse of choice. The musical ride horses conform to pretty strict standards. The same relative size, the same physical characteristics, and even the same color. Unlike the musical ride, Cynthia Mercer is not one for conformity. She's chosen a mid-sized horse to meet her own individual preferences. Their size range from 15-1 to 16-1 hands, and a hand is about four inches, and at the wither, so he's, he will be about 16 hands. His full sister is 16 hands, and she's about seven years old. So, so he's gonna be a fair-sized horse, and probably about 1,200 pounds or something. So he's got a little bit of growing to do yet. The Andalusian breed, 80% of them are grays. They look white, but they're called gray. If they're gonna turn gray, they'll have a few white flecks of hair through their coat. He's already got a lot of gray throughout his coat. But it will take many years, maybe up until the time they're 15 or 18 years old before they get to the point of becoming completely white. 
As for competition, I'm hoping to one day get him to do some dressage since the breed is so well known for that. They're a very good breed for trick training. They're not as big as some of the other horses, but they're very animated in their gaits. They make a great family horse. They're very intelligent. They learn very fast, so, you know, to teach them things, they're very quick to learn. He'll be a lot more of a companion horse than a competition horse. He's just one year old, so he has a lot of training to, be, to do and also just to learn his manners. Competition is not an immediate priority for Cynthia or her horses, but it is a big part of the modern horse world. Racing, jumping, eventing, and even bucking. This is the domain of the middle-sized horse. This is where it doesn't pay to be too big or too small. Because here it's not about bulk or height, but about proportion. The horse's relative size to the rider more than to other horses. The shape and position of the horse's legs, back and head, and whether the horse is a good fit for the rider and the style of riding. Horse and rider, rider and horse. Two bodies moving in rhythm and harmony. The prerequisite for success when it comes to equine competition. And it doesn't just happen. Both competitors, rider and horse, have a lot to learn and a lot to practice. You often can tell a horse is going to refuse before they even get to that fence. You can see it in the rider's body. They are maybe not as confident as they need to be, and they actually are sucking back away from the jump before the horse will. It's not the horse having the problem, but it's the rider that's causing the horse to have the problem over the fence. Once they get really confident, they are ready to go, and then the horse will go over the fence too. It kind of gives them an idea of what they should be working on, what they've done and done well, and uh, just kind of enforces to them that they're doing a good job and that they should continue. Oh, it's a huge improvement. Not, sometimes not so much between one show to the next, but typically between one year and the next. I see a lot of changes in the horses. We see new horses coming in a lot, a lot better quality horses than we've had in, in the past and the horses do well by getting better coaching here. So they're not like uh, green children on green riders, which means inexperienced riders and inexperienced horses, which is sometimes is not necessarily the best when they're trying to compete and showcase their own abilities. The proportionate size of horse to rider is key to successful training in the sport. With regards to jumping, there's always a certain element of danger. Obviously, we try to minimize it. Uh, the children have the protective headgear on. But there is a certain amount of risk, like any other sport. It's no different from dirt bike racing, skiing, you name it. Later, when these young riders and horses are performing at world-class events, the size of the horse won't be as important as how well horse and rider move as one. This synchronicity means everything. To achieve sufficient speed and acceleration to hoist horse and rider up and over formidable obstacles, the well-chosen and well-trained middle-sized horse has proven itself to be just perfect for the sport. Dressage is a French word that means the progressive training of horse and rider, and it teaches the horse self-carriage. So it gives the horse balance, it promotes obedience and athletic ability. And if it's done correctly, it is beautiful. It's like taking a small child and teaching it ballet movements.
Well, depending on which way I shift my body weight or which way I shift a, a major muscle, that's going to tell her to do, to go in that direction. It's a special kind of sport, and I guess that's why it's a special kind of bond. You're kind of at the whim of, of the horse. I mean, they only do what we ask them to do because they want to. I could have easily been thrown several times now if she really didn't want to be ridden. Proportion is the key factor again when the riding style changes from the English hunter tradition to the Western style. Here again, not the larger horses, but the mid-sized ones with well-distributed dimensions give them the speed and the agility to turn hard and fast. A lot of work and training goes into all these maneuvers so that horse and rider are literally dancing together and communicating. Those are maneuvers that need to come naturally to a horse even though we have to learn how to communicate with them what we want and, and hence the riding partnership which is necessary between the horse and the rider. What we want to demonstrate now is what we call in a western reining pattern, we call a spin. It's where a horse actually drops back on his back end and his shoulders cross over and he kind of pivots on his hind leg. She's operating this horse with her legs and her weight and her body. She's not using his head or his mouth to pull him around. If you can see, he's pretty relaxed and straight. Good job. From the serenity of the training paddock into the roar of the crowd in the rodeo business. No 2,000 pound draft horses here. Only the most compact, wiry, athletic horses you can find. The riders are no giants either, just tough horsemen in prime physical condition, as long as their luck holds out. I always liked the horses, but the bucking horses really, really intrigued me. When I started, I'll, I thought they were like meaner horses, which is not a really the reality. A lot of people think that the bucking flank strap makes them buck. Well, you can't uh, force a horse to do something in any event. They've got the will to buck, which is make them way, way, way funnier to ride. The horse that bursts from the gate and leaps into the air, twisting and bucking to get rid of its rider, came from the same roots as that icon of the West, the quarter horse. That middle-sized horse with the right build and versatility to be a cowboy's constant partner has herded cattle from the 1800s to the present day, from Alberta south to the American states. At home on the ranch, we use horses in our daily lifestyle to move cattle and, and to work on a ranch. And it's, we keep the traditions of the Old West alive using our horses to move cattle and work cattle. Because we probably got 60 head of horses at home. We'll use several of them hard for a week and then we'll give them a break. So they stay fresh and they like their job. And we keep them where they're always wanting to work and always wanting to do their job. It was the quarter horse that was immortalized in the North American culture as the heroic partner of the fictional cowboys who emblazoned movie and TV screens for generations. Perhaps the most popularized of all horse sports, thoroughbred racing. A professional jockey is not so much concerned about the size of the horse. Thoroughbreds come in the same height and weight range. Being in running shape and having the right attitude are what really count for professional jockeys like Jim McElhaney. 
generally good horses in, in the thoroughbred industry are intelligent. They're very, very intelligent. And I find that they have a good sensibility. They, they enjoy their job, they like what they do, and therefore they have a strong constitution. And for Chantal as well, the size of the horse is not among the ideal features she looks for. The ingredients that would go into a horse that would be something spectacular, exciting, would be a horse that has energy and just has rhythm, balance for themselves as an athlete, but also has the drive and desire to, to be a champion or a winner. And you can feel that when you're on them. What I do when I ride horses is I try to be open-minded and, and I find that they're like people. So try to accommodate, try to change myself or men to them and to their likes and their dislikes. They'll kind of tell you, like their ears flutter when they're happy and when they're upset at you for, you know, petting or doing something or moving on their back, they'll let you know, they'll jump around or they'll pin their ears at you. And so you just sort of, I guess that's the kind of communication you have. You have to just intuitively listen to them. are trained to be competitive. They're put in, in workout patterns and training lessons through the morning to teach them that winning is the goal that they're after. And I've ridden horses whereas they haven't want, been winning races and you can feel them underneath you where they're, they're lacking confidence. They, they just don't seem to have that same uh, confidence. Then all of a sudden things will turn around and they'll get to win a race and you know you can just feel their heart explode and they get a big smile on their face. Like the thoroughbred, the standard bred is a mid-sized horse too. But that's where the similarity ends. Well, the difference between harness racing and thoroughbreds is uh, the thoroughbreds are a kind of a different breed of horse. They're a lot taller and bigger. And uh, standard breds are smaller and they're different gait. A thoroughbred is they race on the gallop. And then standard bred racing, you either race on the trot or the pace. And in standard bred racing, you actually follow a car, so it's actually a moving start. The thoroughbreds, the actually, the jockeys will ride on the horse's back and there's not much actually equipment on the horses uh, besides pretty much the saddle and the bridle. But with standard bread racing, you have everything from different kinds of bridles and back pads, hobbles, boots, uh, obviously the sulky itself, the race bike and any other equipment that has to tow the actual driver around. When you're looking for a standard bred harness racing horse, the best things to look for is uh, the pedigree, which is the bloodlines of the father and the mother, and also you're looking at the conformation, which is the bone structure and build of the horse. And then if you're looking at an aged horse, just his performance, what its other relatives have been doing, and uh, just the mannerism and how well the horse has been doing. For anyone that hasn't done it, I tell them to just come out and give it a shot, whether it's in horse racing or any kind of horses, just to come out and get involved and uh, see what it's all about. Pony, a group of horses who evolved over time into a distinct member of the equine family, having a smaller stature than the average horse and a body type adapted to harsh environments. Among the most familiar ponies in North America are the ones descended from the ponies of Ireland, Scotland and Wales. They have a lot of um, characteristics that help them survive the harsh climate because they were outside all the time helpful partners in terms of farming, driving, riding, anything you like to do with them, they are really up to the task. They're a pleasure to work with.
They generally tend to be uh, something that uh, people can train fairly easily uh, and are able to communicate with it, with it well. I consider that uh, Pony is, is very phlegmatic, um, but he's smart also. An extremely versatile animal uh, in that they can be used for sporting events. We're seeing a number of people now starting to use them for jumping. They can still be taught to jump fences and run around a ring and do different manoeuvres with the feet. They can be taught that just as readily as any other breed can be taught. Above all, they have the most wonderful temperament. Ponies are very dependable, uh, very sure-footed, uh, very kind and very intelligent. And so they're quite easy to train and uh, become really um, wonderful family pets. He's such a gentle animal. He's absolutely wonderful. He's caring. Uh, he can almost babysit the kids for us. I actually get cold shivers when I start to talk about Skiver sometimes, especially with his relationship with Emily. Historically speaking, some ponies spent their lives not as pets, but as pit ponies working in the coal mines. And it went on from the Industrial Revolution right up to the 1960s. Ponies, particularly Shetland ponies, were heavily used down coal mines in uh, Nova Scotia and in England and Scotland. And the work was heavy work dragging tubs on rails, you know, or filled with coal. Often they were given little helmets so that they didn't bump their heads too much on the low roof of the passageways. And once they go down there, they never come back up again. Today, the National Coal Mining Museum for England pays tribute to the hard-working pit pony. While many of the full-sized horses are in demand for their special practical or monetary value, the expanding interest in pony breeds in North America seems to have more to do with people's simple affections for these charming animals. What about full-size horses and their smaller cousins? Do they get along together despite the size difference? Sarah's Gold is a full-size horse, and Miranda is a pony. Horses, you know, have the capacity to form very, very profound friendships and bonds. This is Gold, and this is Miranda. And they are a pair of elderly ladies that have lived together for at least, well, about nine years now. They're not happy when they're apart. They live in the same stall. They get turned out together. And when either one of them is ridden, the other one is always there. Miranda just wants to be with Gold, and she kind of does her thing, and she's quite a little bit more independent. Um, it's really by choice that they hang out together. It's not, it's not because of discipline. And then there's the miniature pony, or miniature horse. What's the difference? According to Eve Dexter, a miniature horse is specifically bred to be an exact replica of a full-sized horse. It has the same proportions, but at a much smaller scale than a horse. Ponies are not miniature horses. They come in many breeds, each with its own distinct characteristics developed over time. These little guys were bred about 400 years ago in the south of Spain, with the intention of them being pets and novelty items. Therefore, they use very sweet, compliant animals to breed them. They just took the smallest of the breed, uh, different breeds, and they bred them down, and eventually they came out with the, like a miniature horse. We now have a breed that breeds true. You have to have registered parents in order to have registered offspring, and one of the registries even requires you to DNA test to prove that they are truly miniature horses. They require the same type of food, but obviously a lot less. But they do require the same veterinary work and the same farrier work and the same dental work as their big counterparts, and the same care. You can have them in a much smaller area. As a matter of fact, they tend to overgraze, so you have to sometimes be a little careful not to give them too much pasture. Just a small, small barn is, is plenty, something for them to, to get in out of the weather. 
But being small doesn't mean that they're delicate. They're hardy. They do well living outside as long as they have a shelter to get in out of the wind and rain. And uh, they, they just seem to, to be a very good little survivors. They're a lot stronger than they look. They can, they can haul like uh, three to five times their body weight depending on the, the ground that they're working on. Horses and ponies are cousins. So they're not just the same because of size. They were developed by evolution in harsh environments and therefore were more diminutive in size in order to survive where they were. When I started, I thought maybe they were more for children or older people who didn't want to handle big horses, but it turns out that just about everybody right across the board of age or, or social uh, involvement seemed to just fall in love with these guys. I find I'm a lot more attached to my minis. I don't know why. I don't know if it's just because they're like big dogs, but I just, I find I'm just, I'm really attached to them. Like I, I mean, I get attached to all my horses, but for some reason the minis seem to to strike me different. It's easier to play with these ones. <laughs> like I know my little uh, little red and white pinto Tinkerbell, a lot, like a lot of times in the winter time, I'll run around the snow and she'll jump on me and lie down and I'll lie on her, you know, playing. So <laughs> it is different in a way because you couldn't really do that with, you know, a thousand pound animal. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't know he's not 1500 pounds. He thinks he's a great big stallion and <laughs> he can take on the world. Pony, miniature, small horse. It makes no difference to Jonathan. He's a Newfoundland pony miniature cross. He's a mixture. His dad's a miniature and his mom's a Newfoundland pony. He's a quiet, gentle temperament, but can be a little bit feisty. He's uh, one years old and he's a little stallion. More than anything, he's Jonathan's constant friend and companion. Horses. We've met the big, the in-between, and the small. And the size, well, does it really matter? Because at the end of the day, whether at work or at play, each and every horse has something special to offer. He's sort of my dream horse. He's a horse that, you know, you say you're going to have one of those one day, but you'd never really expect it to come true. This is a beautiful animal, and he's so kind, and he's just, just a nice horse. They're just such a, a loving animal. They're so compassionate, and I learn more from her every day than I could ever teach her. Um, I guess that's why I'm into horses more than anything. Just great. It's a great pony. There's a relationship there. I mean, how many horses, 1,900 pounds, you take and put them right here in lap right here, and just you almost go to sleep on it, you know? You tell me there's not a bond there? There's no doubt about it. You know, really, really beautiful animal. What seems to count most is not so much the size of a horse, but rather the strength of that unmistakable bond that horses and people continue to share.